Fallout 3 is first and foremost a disaster story. As the title would imply, the game takes place after the world has essentially been reset by nuclear devastation and blanketed by a wide-reaching fallout. Stripped of its old systems by the destructive capabilities of atomic bombs, Fallout 3 presents a world which is trying to rebuild after its utter erasure. From location to location, there are many different folks taking varying approaches to the task, some honorable, some not. Where one town may place a great emphasis on law and order, having a sheriff who keeps the peace in a rather regular economy, another may partake in the degenerate act of slavery, selling humans to make their cash. Whatever the case, Fallout 3 is packed with the diverse responses of a world still reeling from great disaster. Hey there, stranger. I got something I want to talk to you about. I couldn't help but notice that you were poking around in Bill's shed. So, did you find what you were looking for in there? What Fallout 3 can provide in its quest lines is akin to what disaster stories in general provide. The dynamics of a people under stress from the world around them. In response to extreme outside stimuli, people take many different forms, and their deepest philosophies prevail in these situations, showing their true colors during the most demanding of circumstances. The player in Fallout 3 is in a way just like any other character in a disaster story, faced with choices, dilemmas, and little disasters of their own in this post-apocalyptic world. The player is given opportunities to not only define themselves, but shape the world around them. A role-playing game, Fallout 3 can be approached a few different ways. Will you be the quiet and devious schemer, or the diplomat with a good head on his shoulders? The one who runs from trouble, or the bull who charges at it head first? Though lacking in the role-playing department compared to its successor, Fallout New Vegas, Fallout 3 still undoubtedly offers the player at least some amount of decision-making, letting them shape the fates of those they run across, and all the while mold the capital wasteland in their image. Yet, with the ingredient of nuclear holocaust tossed into the mix, Fallout is given a different and unique air from that of other disaster stories. Whereas other disaster stories tend to happen solely in the moment, during and in the midst of said disaster, Fallout is a game which takes place long after its farthest reaching and most consequential disaster. In a way then, although there are ample quest lines and stories to discover, Fallout isn't only a matter of how people react to this Armageddon, but an examination of how the world itself has broken and changed under it. The dropping of the bombs is a global catastrophe so atrocious and far-reaching that in its wake follows a new timeline, a post-war world in which the player lives. However, this captures only half of Fallout's identity, as a heavy element of the game is obviously nostalgia, and a general fondness for Americana and pre-war aesthetic. Fallout can certainly be defined as a conjoining of pre-war and post-war environments, set in a green-tinted wasteland perhaps, yet filled with hints of old American living, whether it be in the form of music, attire, or architecture. Truly, one of Fallout's defining elements, then, is the juxtaposition between these two worlds, one older, nostalgic, and desirable, and the other present and regrettable. Truly, there are only two sides to the atomic disaster story, the before and the after. Seeing as how it's more or less a gunshot to the world's head, there is not nearly any room for a story set during the detonation of the bombs, so the main options are either a story set beforehand or afterwards. Fallout offers a bit of both, resulting in a wasteland made all the more depressing and a past made that much more appealing. Yet everything has a tendency to look better in hindsight, especially if one's conception of the past is Bob Crosby and white picket fence suburbs. But when the rose-tinted goggles are evoked and a clear-cut portrait of the past made apparent, then it starts to make more sense just why things turned out the way they did. Uh, if the pilot's good, see? I mean, I mean, if he's really sharp, he can barrel that baby in so low. I mean, <laughs> you ought to see it sometime. It's a sight. A big plane, like a 52. Room! This jet exhaust frying chickens in the barnyard! <laughs> Dr. Strangelove is a disaster story, as is Fallout 3 in its companions, yet it is made unique in its own right by being set not during, not after, but before disaster. 
with a story focused on American and Russian heads of state scrambling desperately to prevent a quickly approaching doomsday that they surely brought upon themselves. Governmental recklessness and inconsideration is made plain to the audience. Everything in Dr. Strangelove is a series of too lates. The men who have damned the world slowly begin to remember just how assured their damnation is, as every secret Cold War military provision is brought to light, including the infamous Doomsday Machine. Dr. Strangelove. Or how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. A moving <laughs> picture. Though the film isn't set in the Fallout universe exactly, Dr. Strangelove feels like a fitting precursor, the prequel with a scathing critique of those who once held power, showing everything no matter how petty or adolescent. Needless to say, it ends right where Fallout begins. The pity of an atomic disaster story, set after disaster, is that those who usher out the world will disappear with it, their sins and transgressions on man forgotten, and culpability abandoned. It is rather hard to hold men accountable when their crimes assure there will be no one left at all. Most every major character in Dr. Strangelove, from General Turgidson to the President, to even Dr. Strangelove himself, is utterly insane, though obviously, there won't be anybody around to remember that. Fallout 3 assures accountability about as much. Not a single pre-war politician remains in the shattered, post-war Washington DC, and in Fallout lore, even the name of the United States final president before the bombs dropped is essentially unknown, as no Fallout game to date has offered up anything more than a signature, starting with the letters D.I. Whatever that means is anyone's guess. Truly, the post-atomic disaster story guarantees no culpability no real identification of the destroyers of the world, let alone any avenue of recourse against them. Yet Fallout does offer something, if nothing else, some kind of evidence for the crimes, which remains even after disaster strikes. Mr. President, I would not rule out the chance to preserve a nucleus of human specimens. It would be quite easy. <laughs> At the bottom of the... Some of our deeper mind shafts. An interesting detail to note regarding Dr. Strangelove is that as the film nears its end, and nuclear devastation appears an inevitability, the heads of state discuss the potential necessity for Americans to hunker down below ground in mine shafts in order to wait out the radiation on the surface. A fascinatingly similar concept to that of underground vault shelters in the later Fallout games. While the idea posed in Dr. Strangelove is done so in a fashion much too late to be carried out to completion, the concept is very much realized in Fallout 3. Fans will know that the notion of underground dwellings is an integral facet of the Fallout lore, and, more importantly, serve as cold, hard proof of governmental insanity which remains even after a world-wiping nuclear holocaust. Friends, your future may not be as secure as you think. Where will you be when the atomic bombs fall? Before the war, the vault shelters were nominally meant as an assurance of safety in the event of nuclear devastation. They were to serve as legitimate housing plans for American families in the event of such catastrophe. However, others were fronts for psychological operations testing its unsuspecting human occupants, like rats, out of some sick desire to see the limitations of man pushed. For instance, Vault 92 held a population of exclusively musicians, coming fit with a music recording room in which they were allowed to play their instruments in harmony. In that room, however, a faint, perceptibly inaudible white noise was hummed through speakers, through which certain messages were delivered into the heads of those exposed to the sound. The idea was to examine the viability of mind control via white noise, seeing just how manipulated those under its influence could be. At first, certain tics such as the impulse to scratch one's ear were successfully implanted into the subjects at will, but at a point, the residents became sick, their mental states deteriorating as a result of the tests, and eventually, violence ensued. Oh, disaster today. One of our test subjects, V920717, has murdered three other residents in a fit of unbridled rage, the likes of which I've never seen. 
It took almost 23 shots before the security team took him down. This subject has no history of violence or mental instability whatsoever. Though irrefutably deranged and undeniably the most morally repugnant projects found throughout Fallout, the vaults bear no real association with any one individual. Stamped onto the work is nothing more than the brand and the corporate calling card of those shadowy few who orchestrated them. All the player is really given is a colorful, cartoony mascot and a company name, vault -Tec. Constructed by the vault -Tec Corporation, a government contractor for a brief period shortly before the bombs fell, the sick experiments which were ingrained into the layouts of various vault shelters weren't the doing of the US government exactly, but they certainly subsidized them. It can be said then that the vault experiments were the products of both American money and insidious corporate slickness. If Uncle Sam was the producer, then the heads of vault -Tec were the directors, not only overseeing the construction of these claustrophobic hellholes, but also curating the very precise marketing of said vaults. vault -Tec's business practice was to use American gullibility against them. The Vault Boy character is perhaps the most blatant case of this, using an easy-on-the-eyes mascot to manipulate and assuage consumer worries, hiding atrocious crimes underneath. God bless the USA and nowhere else. By the time anyone actually figured out what was going on beneath the surface, it would be much too late, and those behind it all would surely be dead or otherwise long gone. All that would remain would be that which had already been public facing all along. And what are you going to do? Blame a mascot? A highly beloved one at that? After all, even fans of the Fallout games who exist in the real world outside of that fictional universe can't help but find themselves charmed by Vault Boy despite what he may actually represent. But at least there's a pretense of noble aims in vault goal, even if nothing more than scummy corporate appeals in the manipulation of consumer emotion, there's a layer of well-meaning in their advertising. That is to say, one could maybe buy their supposedly good intentions, even if false and still tinged with a kind of corporate unease all the same. Reserve your family spot in a state-of-the-art underground vault today. Sign up now and prepare for the future. But somewhere, far away, over miles and miles of oceans and salt water, and isolated from the rest of the world, is Point Lookout, a lonely place that knows not of good intention, not even that which is fraudulent or for show. An add-on to Fallout 3, which is generally cited as one of the best of its five main DLCs, Point Lookout is very much a kind of open-world vault, in the sense that it too is rather abandoned, quiet, and near lifeless. Yet it is set in a space much larger and more open-ended than any single vault in Fallout 3. Set in a sleepy, fog-ridden town by the sea, which has been forgotten and abandoned by civilized society, Point Lookout offers the chance to unearth secrets long lost. Some damning, perhaps. On its Fallout wiki page, Point Lookout is described as a place where, quote, the bombs didn't actually fall, but the world has left it behind. Akin to well-crafted vaults, Point Lookout feels like a place where time has stopped. Its people comprise a sadly forgotten tragedy, left unaided by a government who were too tied up in petty political pursuits and crimes of their own. Said crimes are, might I add, laid bare and naked in Point Lookout. Maybe in the capital wasteland there is the idea of something better, the mere hope of a better past and more noble motives, but in Point Lookout, there is little to none of this corporate gloss. It is a place where no bombs fell, thus there are no vaults. And without vaults, there are no marketing ploys by corporate forces to sell them, no pretty mascots or emotional appeals to the American way of life. Although it is set on an island with a lighthouse to boot, somewhat reminiscent of John Carpenter's 1980 film The Fog, there is no lady with a radio station operating out of the lighthouse as there is in that film, nor is there one operating anywhere else in Point Lookout. Without a radio station, and thus without music, that Bob Crosby-induced nostalgia of the main game is stripped, leaving only the quiet, naked desolation and grimness of this forgotten place. Its crimes are, at best, hidden behind fences and security, without any corporate gloss to cover it up nicely, as there is no vault tech here.
Point Lookout alone is what is seen and what is judged by the player, and so fittingly, it feels the grimmest disaster story in Fallout 3. In similar vein to Fallout 3's vaults once again, Point Lookout is a blunt critique of domestic and global politics, presenting enemies who are nothing more than normal folk subjected to government neglect, mere humans morphed by unmitigated radiation exposure, rendering them the primary victims of what is officially documented as New Plague. This malady affects both body and mind, rendering Point Lookout's residents hostile mutations of humans who attack on sight. They are, in a way, Point Lookout's own version of the ghouls found scurrying the capital wasteland, who too are radiation-infected humans. Yet Point Lookout's swamp folk, as they are called, resemble something much closer to humans than the green, skinless ghouls, and so there is a greater sadness seeing them in their particular plight. Where the ghoul enemies in Fallout 3 are typically feral, mentally devolved to a point of being unspeaking animals that snarl at best, Point Lookout Swamp Folk still speak, are still capable of operating machines like firearms, and emit an overall image at least approaching human. To kill a ghoul glowing from radiation and scratching at you like a rat is to play a video game, dispensing of an enemy befitting of a video game, and that's all they usually are. Enemies. Hell, even in Point Lookout, there's a high-functioning ghoul by the name of Plick who charges caps for a run-through what he deems his safari, a mini-game of sorts in which the player slaughters oncoming feral ghouls by the truckloads. But the swamp folks of Point Lookout require a double take, certainly upon first sighting, yet even after the 50th or 100th kill, it still feels different from killing any old feral ghoul. Yet neither is it quite like killing a sentient ghoul with a story to tell. The swamp folk exist in a middle ground. Killing them isn't quite like breezing through a safari in a video game, although neither is it exactly like killing something sentient and reasonable. They're like helpless children, I suppose, or at least child-minded. You're not so much killing an enemy as you are putting a poor soul out of their misery, souls otherwise forgotten and left behind. More than just great tragedy, Point Lookout also manages to intertwine a great critique of the US government, and I suppose the Chinese government as well, into its story, showing very strongly the misplaced priorities of global politics. Intentionally, I would assume, there was an American detention center for Chinese agents placed right smack in the middle of the swamplands. In the same vicinity as a populace suffering from new plague, the US government spends its time and resources not on aiding the medical relief effort arrived in Point Lookout, but on torturing and killing Chinese spies. The Chinese aren't innocent either, as one of the DLC's quests requires the player to take up the failed mission of a deceased spy, sent to Point Lookout only to trigger the self-destruction of a sunken Chinese submarine in nearby waters. Great measures, the player learns, were taken by the Chinese government to arrange for covert correspondence with their agent in Point Lookout. Mission details were hidden in bank safes behind voice-activated locks. The original agent, Agent Wan Yang, hid the submarine's self-destruct codes in a data chip buried in a fake molar she wore in the back of her mouth. And at the quest's completion, the player even finds a hidden bunker beneath an island mansion, used by the Chinese right under American noses. Clearance acknowledged. Follow me for your extraction debriefing. Comrade. They go to such great lengths for the mission, the agents themselves die for the cause, and yet it's such a petty thing. One side wants to locate the submarine, and the other wants to destroy it. Yet it's also unimportant in the grand scheme of things, especially when there are normal people in need of real help. In this, Point Lookout offers one of Fallout 3's better critiques of global affairs and the misplaced priorities of government, and it's an especially interesting one as Point Lookout isn't even a land ravaged by bombs, 
yet American irresponsibility is still as apparent here as it is in the capital wasteland. Of course, Fallout isn't Fallout without a dash of humor, something to liven up the otherwise dull and depressing atmosphere. Bethesda believes this more than anyone, and so players can discover throughout Fallout 3 heaping dashes of humor, even where it is certainly unnecessary. Yet with Point Lookout, they manage to tone it down a notch. In compliance with the atmosphere of abandonment and tragedy, there aren't any flamboyant attempts at humor as seen in the Capital Wasteland, as that would be disruptive. Rather, the funny elements are a bit less pronounced, and so they're appreciated more. Actually, besides maybe one or two other minor characters, there aren't that many instances of comedic relief, the foremost case being the bitter feud between a ghoul named Desmond and a long-deceased rival of the Calvert lineage, whose brain and consciousness alone is retained via scientific means. You disgusting, greasy, uncranium bastard. The player aids Desmond initially, fending off an attack on his home by local tribals, and later helping him discover the source of the raid, an order from Calvert, whose disembodied consciousness the tribals foolishly believe to be some kind of god. Whether it be how to explore higher planes, or the decision to remove the disruptive ghoul, all wisdom comes from the transcendent master. Calvert uses their misplaced trust as leverage against Desmond, throwing dozens of the tribals at his rival to be killed off like flesh minions, worth nothing more than the mission to which they are assigned, very much in the same vein of a callous military general. Honestly, those fools aren't worth the meat they're made of. A minion that can't follow directions is no use at all. Mr. President, I'm not saying we wouldn't get our hair must, but I do say no more than 10 to 20 million kill tops. Uh, depending on the breaks. Blows are traded and tensions rise, until Desmond drags the player beneath the nearby lighthouse to kill his nemesis once and for all, or at least, the brain kept alive in a tank. When the two are met, they trade insults ad nauseum, perpetually entrapped in their own verbal combat. You disembodied, pathetic cerebellum. So vulgar, Mr. Lockhart. After all this time, you still haven't learned to expand your vocabulary. And you, always with empty fucking threats and meaningless drivel, but never the will to act. You know nothing, you are nothing! If you're such a man of will, attack me and be done with it! Or do you fear for your life? I'll have none of your posturing, you disgusting greasy. Until the player chooses to end it by killing one or the other. At last, the world is rid of that sniveling, disgusting, arrogant brain. Think of it. Everything he learned, everything he had, it's all here, and it's all mine. Mine! Although the only right choice in my mind is to kill them both. The questline is quite funny on a conceptual level, the mere notion of this never-ending rivalry between two petty men, reaching back since before the war and extending years after the bombs fell too, even persisting when one party has become a ghoul and the other is without so much as a body to fight with. However, when taking into account the rest of what Point Lookout has to offer, the humorous butting of heads between these two men takes on a whole new meaning. This is not merely a source of comedic relief for the DLC but it is a humorous and easily digestible microcosm for the great governmental shortcomings buried in Point Lookout. The perpetual regressive fighting between Desmond and Calvert is more or less an allegory for the unproductive warring between the United States and the Chinese governments. Their personal vindictive feuding boils down global politics to its simplest and most unadorned form. Absent the pretext of noble aims, the bickering of the superpowers is essentially just a dirty fight for control. It may be bragging rights not so different from the ignoble pursuits of Point Lookout's last remaining aristocrats. Desmond will die, and our long struggle will finally end the only way it could have, with me as the victor! 
And say what you will about the men in Doctor Strangelove, or even the heads of vault -Tec, but at least they had some reason to consider their aims valiant. They held some type of reverence for their positions, even if used for ultimately calamitous ends. Given surface level descriptions, vault was a company bent on protecting and preserving the jeopardized lives of American families. General Turdidson was a red-blooded American patriot with the best interests of his nation kept in constant consideration. The president was a symbol of diplomacy who maintained a front of civility during terrifying times, and Dr. Strangelove was, well... Of course, they were all insane, without a real capacity for introspection, or any sense of the common man's wishes, but they could claim something else more respectable motives, or at least deemed respectable by the average citizen. But can Desmond and Calvert? Do they fight for something at all, or is it just some sick addiction? Perhaps this is what war has always been, yet there was always some reason or another for it to be viewed as something more honorable. The killing was for a cause greater than the individual, and the war was an honorable and dignified occupation. But in Point Lookout, just as there is no vault tech to paint over the sins of the American government, there is no longer even an American government to falsely justify the fight between Desmond and Calvert. What remains are the bare bones of conflict, no suits, no titles, no state, not even can either man claim to fight for his own skin as time has taken that, and the body in the case of Calvert. They fight when there is nothing left to fight over. I knew he was here, and it is my intent to find him, and call down a righteous fucking hammer on his head. Figurative, I mean. His head. It's kind of like a reverse Doctor Strangelove, where instead of having two opposing sides hate each other, but pretend otherwise, Desmond and Calvert actually love each other, or at least, they are in love with their rivalry, yet they veil their addiction to their competition under bloated verbal spiels and puffed up insults. Deep down, they're made for each other, meant to be mortal enemies, each as helplessly obsessed as the other, to a point where they must actually enjoy the thrill of their rivalry, otherwise it would have ended long ago. Galvet is my old rival. Centuries we've played this game. It's not a matter of hate, it's a matter of destiny. He is my enemy, and I do not suffer any bastard who opposes me to live. Point Lookout may be set after disaster, yet Desmond and Calvert's feud is bound by no such time constraint. Their bickering has been perhaps the one constant through it all. Before, during, and after the dropping of the bombs, they've been at each other's throats. People may die, worlds may end, and places may change, but rest assured, these two will always be around to mess with each other. If we were to call this rivalry a petty war of sorts, then I suppose Fallout's tagline really does ring true. War may take many different forms, but it truly never stops. Never changes. Not before disaster, and not after it. War. War never changes. In atomic disaster stories, a good many men don't stick around too long. Whether they're outright killed in the initial blast, or poisoned and irradiated, reduced over generations to something clearly lesser than man. Similarly, those who carry the guilt of those deaths and bear the blame for the crimes are gone without a trace. Naturally, the capabilities of atomic bombs ensure that there's either nobody left to indict those responsible, or nobody left to be indicted at all. Whether or not the culprits actually blow themselves up with the world in their maniacal recklessness, they're surely nowhere to be found in the ensuing rubble. At best, there are left surface-level traces of their existence, such as ads, offices, written reports, and corporate mascots. So too remain their sins, packaged in twisted kinds of time capsules, depraved places like Vault 92 or the abandoned Point Lookout, present still while their bringers are not. Whereas these things are timeless, the men who make them are not. Even the evilest of psychopaths must still confront their own mortality eventually, which perhaps makes them lucky, as there are always a select few who'd surely like to get their hands on them. As for myself, you gaze upon one of America's greatest minds, preserved through the miracles of science! Much more elegant than shambling on is some rotting corpse for all eternity, don't you agree? But what about Desmond and Calvert? 
Surely they are in ways villainous as seem all other men of power, and unlike those men, have yet to succumb to a final death. They are living, keeping alive their pathetic game. Allowed to continue much too long, I thought. There is something rather clever about their relationship, as a metaphor first and foremost, but also the notion that the player is given in them surrogate candidates for blame, other than the unidentifiable machines of government. If Desmond and Calvert are sort of a lesser symbol for warring governmental powers, then a player's choice to kill them both would be a kind of meager restitution for the crimes abundant in the game worlds of Fallout 3 and Point Lookout. Hidden under mascots, symbolism, and vague bureaucracy, both Fallout's institutions of government and insidious corporate powers are formless antagonists, and so they escape blame. With all responsible blown away by the war anyhow, there is no one left to answer for the crimes. We know the crimes committed, and the entities responsible, but alas, no single man stands trial for their misdeeds. The pity of an atomic disaster story set before the disaster is that those who usher out the world will disappear with it. But Desmond and Calvert, although not having been directly involved in either the war effort nor vault tech, are all the same men of selfish inconsideration, guilty of foul abuses of power, deserving of their own kind of punishment, and, unlike certain other disbanded entities, are still around to receive it. In a way, it only feels right to dish it out. It's a kind of long-awaited retribution initially reserved for the true culprits. But with their absence, these undying men make for momentary substitutes. Maybe some slight sliver of justice is enacted in that choice, and perhaps certain wrongs are righted in blowing up Calvert's tank and taking a shovel to Desmond's head. But ultimately, the ones truly to blame, as is typical in Fallout, will go without their own trial, and the messes left in their wake will remain sadly uncleaned for the foreseeable future. The pity of an atomic disaster story set after disaster is that whatever revenge taken in the aftermath will almost certainly be taken too late. Fallout 3 is at times a uniquely humbling game. At once, it allows for great player control and freedom, while also reminding them of that which they cannot change. In Point Lookout, Fallout 3 once again flexes that great muscle it alone holds, the potential to remind players that they inhabit the remnants of a disaster larger than they can imagine, that they exist in a game world riddled with crimes which occurred much too long ago to do anything about. Yet the DLC throws the player a bone in Desmond and Calvert, offering a second-hand, belated justice perhaps satisfying in a way, but certainly delivered much too late, to the wrong people no less. And when you're too late, what else is there to do but pay your respects? As is the case with the main game's various vault experiments, Point Lookout, underpinned by its great air of abandonment and despair, and offering what is only an inadequate retribution for the crimes buried there, feels like another case of Fallout 3 begging the player to simply pay their respect towards what came before to take a walk through the cemetery, if only to remember what most have already forgotten. And truly, no place feels more deserving of that consideration than Point Lookout.